today's webinar titled World Cafe Conversations, A Powerful Method to Support Community Systems Development. My name is Edna Navarro Vidaure, and I'm the Assistant Director of Community Systems Development at Illinois Action for Children. On behalf of Illinois Action for Children and the Consortium for Community Systems Development, we would like to welcome you to today's exciting webinar. To get us started, here are some house housekeeping tips. The session is being recorded and will be available later on our Partner Plan Act website for viewing. There are also three handouts available for you to download on the system. All of the particip participants have currently been muted. If you encounter a technical issue, please either use the chat box in the dashboard to send us a message or you can feel free to email Carla at the email address listed. Now we would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Chris Foster, Illinois Action for Children consultant from Foster What Matters. Chris? Thank you, Edna. Uh, appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to present today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about uh, the World Cafe and in particular, how it can be helpful in our community system development uh, efforts. So let's just talk uh, a few minutes about our objectives for this webinar. Um, first of all, I would like to present uh, some of the key basics of the World Cafe process. For some of you, I realize this may be a review. For others, it may be that you're learning this for the first time. Either way, I hope that there will be some important pieces here for all of you. We'd also like to be able to really explore how cafe conversations can support community systems development. Uh, there are some pretty amazing ways that at their core, they're really about some of the same kinds of um, opportunities that we're trying to create in our communities. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And specifically, when are these cafe conversations uh, the best to use? What types of conversations that we'll be having? And then I also hope that from this uh, webinar, you'll have um, an opportunity to take away some helpful tips for more productive and effective conversations. Um, I don't know about you, but it, um, I find that it doesn't matter how many years I've been using World Cafe and other dialogue processes, there's always opportunity to be working our learning edges as facilitators and hosts and learning new uh, tips and strategies for making these uh, processes be the best they can be. So our agenda today, we're going to divide up our time into kind of three segments. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to just revisit some of those uh, specifics of what really is a World Cafe, when are the best times to use it, and, and why is it helpful. And through that, we'll also be looking at uh, this method through a community systems development lens. Then we'll take a, a few minutes to uh, look at the fundamentals, so revisiting some of the uh, core principles, the etiquette, and the process itself, just getting back to some of those basics uh, for those of you that are familiar with this process and those of you that are new to it, maybe learning it for the first time. And then the last part of the webinar will be focused on some design facilitation or hosting, as I may refer to it, and harvesting tips. And harvesting is the way in which we capture and record the essence, the important uh, uh, result of our conversation. So I'll share some of the tips um, based on my experience, as well as being part of other people's world, world exp cafe experiences, and just being able to identify some of those places where we sometimes forget some of those basics. Obviously, a one-hour webinar is not the equivalent to a training. So at the end of the webinar, I will be providing some additional resources um, to help you uh, deepen and expand your use of cafe. I'll tell you about some actual training opportunities as well as a variety of resources and again to note as Edna said there are a couple of attachments to your doc or to this webinar the cafe to go is an excellent little guide uh, that is very helpful so I encourage you to download that and take a, a look um, 
let me say, uh, as you listen um, throughout this webinar, I just really want to encourage you, again, whether you're a beginner or more skillful World Cafe uh, host, to really consider the ways that you use Cafe um, and how can you even be more effective in its use. I think it's a very powerful method when it's used effectively. So before we go any further, I want to just pause for a moment, take a quick poll, and I'd like to find out which of the following apply to you. And again, you can select all that apply. Uh, I'm interested in finding out how many of you have actually participated or have experience with World Cafe, how many of you have facilitated a World Cafe. I'd also like to know a little bit how you've uh, learned about it. Have you learned about it on your own? Have you attended some kind of a training? And then how many of you are interested in uh, enhancing your skills at whatever level that is? So I'll let uh, my co-organizers present the poll. So again, you can check all that apply. Go ahead and begin. Okay, we're at about 78% that have voted, so we'll give it a couple more seconds. Oh, we're at 81. <laughs> there we go. This will just help me kind of know who's on the call. Frame my responses appropriately. And we're at about 91. A couple more seconds and then we're going to close it. So make sure you get all your responses in. actually experiencing it. So those that haven't had this opportunity to actually be in a cafe, I encourage you to seek one out, even if it's outside the realm of your day-to-day -day work, uh, just to have that experience. Um, see, it looks like a few of you have actually facilitated. Um, some of you have learned on your own. Some of you have attended training. And it looks like most of you are interested in enhancing your skills. So very good. All right, well, let's get to it. I appreciate everyone taking a moment to respond to that poll. Okay. All right, so what is a World Cafe? Um, here's a couple of photos from a cafe that happened last fall at an Art of Hosting Conversations That Matter retreat where we were introducing a variety of these kinds of methods to people just like yourself who are doing important work in the world and understand the value of conversation to really lead and create change. So what is a World Cafe? Um, at its core, it is a very simple group dialogue method for engaging in conversations that matter. And when we talk about conversations that matter and a type of conversation, we're really talking about a very different type of conversation. So often the conversations that we're in are dialogue based, or excuse me, discussion based, where we're sharing differing ideas, different perspectives back and forth. But dialogue really invites us into a different type of conversation where it's about sharing our ideas, but it's doing so in a way that we get to a larger context or a larger story where all these ideas that have been combined together really result in synergistically something more and it really reflects this kind of uh, emergent type or gen generative form of conversation. And because it's generative, because it's more than just making lists or comparing ideas, it really is a way of making meaning together and surfacing the collective intelligence that already exists within a, a group that can help us get to wiser conditions, or excuse me, wiser action. 
So the process in and of itself, which we'll talk about more in a minute, creates the conditions, the principles, the etiquette, the process that we're going to be talking about, really help us move beyond this typical forms of discussion or even debates, and really invites the wisdom that is already in the room to be linked. And as a result, this collective wisdom uh, can emerge. At the core of World Cafe are three primary assumptions, and I think it's important to address these kind of upfront because it really shows us how we're creating conditions in a different way to get beyond our typical kinds of conversations that we often find ourselves in. First of all, the knowledge and the wisdom we need is already in the room. So it assumes that we don't necessarily need experts to come in and help us solve our problems, but together when we share the wisdom that we each have, that synergistically we can get to something more. And that leads us to this second assumption. Intelligence emerges as the system connects to itself in creative and meaningful ways. We connect through conversation, and it's in that conversation that we're able to uh, surface and recognize new and important things that we may not have had ourselves. If you think about a conversation that you've been in, have you ever had the experience where, whether you were talking to one person or multiple people, that it was in the conversation that all of a sudden you had a new insight or a new understanding about the topic at hand or the question that you were exploring? That same thing can happen on an even larger scale when we come together in small and large groups and have meaningful conversation around questions that matter, that in that sense, we're really generating a possibility for something new to emerge, creative insights, the wisdom that's there can come forward in meaningful ways. And this collective insight really involves because of the way that we're interacting with one another, the way we're honoring unique contributions that are being made, where we're really listening to connect ideas rather than see how our ideas are different or defend our ideas. We're looking to see how does someone else see something that may be similar but different or very different altogether. And so how do we connect all that in such a way that we can walk away with a, a deeper understanding? We're also listening into the middle. And what this really means is that it's not about what one person or another person says, it's listening to the greater whole of what's surfacing in the middle of that conversation. So it's listening for what's new, what's emerging, what's bubbling up, as we like to say, from this conversation that maybe we couldn't have even predicted. And in doing this, we're noticing those deeper patterns and questions that help us get to that higher level of insight. One of the things that World Cafe invites us to do then is to really connect with ourselves, taking the time to be able to even think about what our own understanding or thoughts are about a particular situation, and to connect with each other. And so that wisdom of the whole emerges and reveals the wise action that's possible. And part of this really is just slowing down, slowing down long enough to connect, to think well together before moving into action. So let's talk about how these assumptions kind of play out and relate to our work in community systems development. For me, I think first and foremost, that as we think about World Cafe and some of those assumptions, for example, that we just talked about, and our work in community systems development, they're both really based on this assumption that when we come together, we're smarter and more capable when we work together than when we work alone. This diagram here in the middle of the slide is the build silos, and many of you are probably familiar with, and whether you use that as an organizing way of thinking about your community systems development work or not, that's okay. But as we think about the sectors, the programs and services, the agencies, the various um, constituents in our communities that we're bringing together so that we can more effectively support young children and developing to their fullest potential and being ready for success in kindergarten and beyond, what we're really doing is we're working on building relationships. We're working on trying to create a system that reflects the best of these individual systems, but also at the same time is reflective of a system that's working together as a, a whole. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so by building this interconnectedness, we can create to a greater possibility Excuse me.
of what's possible, what we can do together that we can't really do alone. <clears throat> And so core of the World Cafe is really the same kind of idea. We move in and out of individual smaller group conversations to large group conversations. And even how we leak conversations over time together allows us to be able to come together in such a way that we're building relationships, that we're no longer thinking in individual uh, sets of expertise or perspective, but that we're linking and creating those ideas in such a way that we get to see the bigger whole of what's there. So, <clears throat> excuse me. In many ways, World Cafe and Community Systems Development are enacting conversational leadership. It's using conversation as a core process to engage everyone's leadership and wisdom so that collectively we can be smarter, wiser, and more capable of creating the change that we're seeking to create in the world. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about when to use World Cafe because people together and it's been used for groups of a thousand or more so it's got a lot of flexibility in terms of how many people it can accommodate ideally I would not recommend trying to do a world cafe in any less than two hours generally I say more like two and a half or three hours um, so that we're leaving plenty of spaciousness for our conversation that we're not rushing and we're giving time for that emergence to occur and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit so some of the, the reasons I might use a World Cafe have to do with if I'm interested in bringing people together to connect people, to be building some relationships, um, getting people to know each other. Usually that's not my primary reason, but it's absolutely something that happens in World Cafes. So it's a legitimate reason to use a cafe. Hopefully you're building on that. That's just a first stage. It's also um, ideal when you're trying to exchange knowledge or experiences. Note that I didn't say share. So it's not just about one person telling and another person telling, but it's about the exchange that's important so that we might each um, share our knowledge or our expertise, but we're doing that in such a way that e each is informing the others and we can get to a greater understanding of what that's all about. Whenever you want to explore a topic or a question in depth, World Cafe is an ideal opportunity to do that. So if you don't have a question ha that has real kind of, it's an intriguing question with some depth uh, when you're addressing complex issues, this is a key method for doing that. And if it's important to get to shared understanding, and really, is that really a question, right? In our work of community systems development, we're always trying to get, um, bring together our partners to get to some greater understanding of the problems that our families are facing in our communities, of the needs that they have, and of opportunities that we can capitalize on. But trying to get everyone on the same page can be challenging. World Cafe, because of the way it connects and links people and links ideas and has plenty of opportunity to explore complex questions and issues, it, it really can help us ideally with that. If you're brainstorming options or stimulating uh, innovative thinking, there is this generative potential to World Cafe. So anything that's involved with coming, coming together and creating new knowledge, creating new insight, coming up with new ideas, new options to do things, it's, it's ideal. And then finally, at the heart of all our work with community systems development, at the heart of systems thinking is this whole idea of how do we understand complex systems and how do we continually learn about what's working and what's not so that we can adapt and be flexible. World Cafe is a great opportunity for us to come together and to do those things. Now, when is World Cafe not appropriate? This is also important to know. Again, if you have 12 or fewer people, I wouldn't suggest World Cafe. It loses some of it. With a smaller group, you might as well stay together as a small group. And again, if you have less than two hours, 
you know, the caveat is it may depend on what your content is, but generally speaking, um, don't lose out on the magic of this method because you try to collapse it into too short of a period of time. Specifically, if any one of the three of these are your objective, then I would suggest find another method because this will, um, it's not needed. If you're just simply conveying information, you don't need a world cafe. If you're sharing information and you really want to explore what this information means to us, how does this play out in our community, um, that's different because there's a generative nature to that. There's something that you're going to want to do with that information. But if it's just sharing information, this is not the way to do it. If your solution, decision, action, if it's already been decided, then again, World Cafe is not appropriate because the cafe is about opening up and figuring out together and if it's already been decided if it's already been figured out then you don't need a cafe uh, to move forward and then finally decision making or action planning similar to the one I just talked about um, if you're trying to make decisions or you're trying to plan out what to do next this isn't the most ideal for that specifically however as it says if you're still in the early stages of decision making, you're still trying to decide, you know you've got a decision to make and you're still kind of feeling it out, you're still trying to gather some information to inform the decision that's going to be made, then that's a little different because you're really still engaging diverse perspectives and engaging people and figuring it out together. Um, but if it's about making a decision, there's other methods that are better for that. Action planning can kind of be the same way. It's mostly, you know, if it's about thinking well together, but it's not really about deciding on what the final action plan should be. So with all of that, I'd like to just take a moment and ask you to respond in uh, the chat feature. How has or is your World Cafe been part of your community system development efforts? So I've listed a few here that are similar to uh, what we just talked about, but of course that wasn't an exclusive list. So if there's other um, ways that you've incorporated World Cafe, please go ahead and share that with us now too. So let me just take a moment to let you respond if you're able. I realize many of you may be just listening, maybe not at your computer, but if you're able to, go ahead and respond. See, some of you are newer to community systems development work, so may not have had an opportunity. Many communities do parent cafes, which is a derivative from the core world cafe process. It's a uh, a cafe that's been designed with a specific intent, with a specific set of questions and process to support parents. And so many of you may have experienced that. Some people have used it for building relationships and brainstorming. Very good. Well, I invite you to continue to uh, go ahead and post any responses that you may have and to just jot this down for yourself uh, as a question to be thinking about, you know, what are the many ways in which a cafe can be used in our community to help us be more effective uh, together? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Oops. All right. So just to kind of summarize this part for a moment, why use a World Cafe? Um, for the most part, a cafe is fairly easy to facilitate as long as you really stay true and watch and follow the principles, the etiquette, and the process. I think the, the biggest challenge people have when they try to facilitate a cafe is they try to control it a little bit too much and don't let the magic of the process really do its thing. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. I believe that World Cafe is a wonderful method for really engaging stakeholders in a deeper and more powerful way. 
We are always trying to engage our, our stakeholders and we often bring people together and we share information, but we don't always engage people to the extent that it's possible. And I think that the combination of small and large group conversation is ideal for whether you're an introvert or extrovert. It gives opportunities for people to talk um, at different levels. And really in the CAFE method, every voice has an opportunity to be engaged in those, those small groups, so it's not just passive listening. I also think you can have much more effective conversations. Uh, it's again beyond an exchange of information to an emergence of something more, you know, that magic in the middle that can only result when we come together in good conversation. And I think the practices of listening and observing, it's part of the etiquette that we'll talk about in a minute, is you know, what is emerging in the center? That's the something more that can result. And the results really can be better when we're in it together and we're really having these good conversations. So let me just pause here for a moment. That was kind of the quick overview of the what, the when, and the why. We'll continue to explore the what as we get into some of the principles and etiquette and the actual process. But I just wanted to pause and see if there's any questions that anyone has so far. I do see that uh, more people have responded and how they use the cafe for brainstorming, reviewing data, um, use the World Cafe with groups of early childhood stakeholders to think about their vision for the work that they want to be doing together, a very powerful way of bringing people together. Um, Another has said it aligns nicely with a reflective stance approach. This is how I developed team meetings and I could see easily incorporating some of the cafe techniques. Great. All right. Very good. So if there are any other questions or comments right now, there'll be other opportunities down uh, further into the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and continue to move us along. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the fundamentals of how cafes actually work. And I think, again, just like we started with exploring some of the assumptions, we need to start the, exploring the process by understanding kind of the principles that etiquette are at the core of this, uh, this method. If you haven't already um, downloaded the uh, Go uh, Cafe on the go. There is a great resource with some of these basics in it that go through some of these details to look at later. But just talking briefly, the principles and etiquettes are really very closely aligned, and that's why I have them together here on this slide. So let me just start with saying a few things about the principles, and then we'll talk a moment about the guidelines or the etiquette as I'm referring to it. First of all, one of the principles is, is this idea to set the context, to really be clear what the need is for the conversation, the purpose of why we're having the, the, uh, the conversation, the intent, what some of those core questions are. People need context in order to be able to be at their best with thinking and working together. Creating hospitable space, it's kind of that idea of when you host a party, right? We're paying attention to all the details that are going to help people feel welcome, uh, needed in that conversation or at that party, feeling relaxed, present, and because when people feel safe, when they're feeling invited like that, we can show up with our best self and do our best creative uh, contributions to the conversation. Another critical piece of this process is to explore questions that matter. So really understanding what are the core questions that can help us get into a different way of thinking or understanding or exploring a question or a topic or a situation that move us from kind of the way it is now to new possibilities that come. And we're going to spend some time talking about this as we go on as well. The fourth principle is encouraging everyone's contribution, contributions and core to this principle is just an understanding or assumption, if you will, that not only do people want to participate, but we're, as human beings, we're all interested in contributing to making a difference. And so how do we, how do we provide the conditions? How do we provide a process that allow people to do that effortlessly? The next principle is connect diverse perspectives. Connect diverse perspectives is central to uh, World Cafe and again central, all these principles really can apply to our community systems development work, but it's not enough to just collect diverse perspectives, 
but to really think about and provide a process that we can cross pollinate those ideas. So those perspectives grow from something that's very individual to a collective understanding of a problem, a situation, an opportunity. And it's the it's the in the exchanges that happen through the Rural Cafe process that allow that to happen so beautifully. The last two principles have to do with listen together for the insights or patterns that are emerging. Um, again, part of our the quality of our listening, there's a huge emphasis on how we're listening. So not just what we're sharing as we're sharing our perspectives, but listening not only to what individuals are contributing, but really listening for patterns that are emerging in the conversation. Those new ideas or thoughts that are bubbling up that are beyond what any one person said and really are the new generative piece that's resulting. And then sharing our collective discoveries. Often this is referred to as the harvest. So what is it? What is that pattern that we're revealing? What's coming here that now belongs to the group as a whole that isn't any one person or group, small group's thoughts, but it's really the, it's the pattern, it's the wholeness that is emerging because of the way we've come together. These principles then guide us not only in how we design our cafes but and facilitate or host those cafes, but it's also part of what's been developed as the World Cafe Guidelines or Etiquette, and that's the graphic on your right. And these are some of the core practices that we invite participants into as they begin to engage in the World Cafe conversations. So there are things like very similar to the principles about really being able to show up with your whole self, to really focus on what matters, to speak with your mind and your heart, to contribute your thinking, to be able to be collectively uh, responsible for facilitating that conversation, not turning to just someone else. Remembering to listen to understand, so it's not just conveying ideas, but really what's being said here from another person or what's being said in this conversation? What is it that's, that's bubbling up here? And listening for those connections, linking those ideas together, and again, reminding ourselves to slow down. And of course, at the core of this process is that let's have some fun doing it. Let's not take ourselves too seriously, even though we're talking about serious things, because when we're in that kind of space, that lighthearted, uh, hospitable space, we really can be at our best. And then to play draw and doodle, that we all capture the conversation. We'll say more about this in just a few minutes. All right. The World Cafe process. Uh, there's really kind of four key elements to this process. It's about creating the conditions for a great conversation. So it happens both before and during the conversation. Welcoming and setting the context. Engaging in multiple rounds of small group conversation and sometimes mixed with large group conversation. And then harvesting the conversation. Again, harvest is a term that we use for what, what are we taking from this conversation? What is that that has emerged that wasn't here before the conversation started? And again, just referencing that quick reference guide um, where there's more detail about this process as well. So let's go ahead and unpack this a little bit for each one of these. First one, create the conditions. I'm gonna talk about two different aspects of this. One is, has to do with the imitation and one has to do with the space. I can't emphasize enough the importance of a really good invitation that happens obviously prior to the event. So sending out an intriguing inquiry-based invitation does a number of things. One, it helps people get to thinking about what is it that this is about before they even get there. So what are those questions? By asking questions rather than just stating a topic, gets people engaged in the, the thought process in a different way than it does when you just say what the topic is. So those questions should be intriguing and we'll talk a little bit more about some other characteristics of really good questions. But it helps them think about start to think about it before they arrive. It also, it should help people understand or see themselves in that, in that conversation. It should be something I really want to be about. They don't always have to be pretty. They don't have to be well designed, but the content is what matters. So those questions um, are most important and then helping people be able to see themselves in that. All right, let's talk about space for a minute. 
Oh, let me just go back for a minute. One other thing that you can also do uh, to help kind of create these conditions, even in the invitation, to create a sense of the ambiance of what this is about, is you can name your cafe. It doesn't just need to be called a world cafe. That's the process you're going to use. But often people will name their cafes. It might be a leadership cafe, an innovation cafe, a strategy cafe, a parent cafe, something that customizes it to be really about what it is that you hope to be um, exploring through that conversation. It's another way to just help with that. All right, let's talk about the conditions uh, in terms of space. Um, cafe setup, you can see here in these pictures a number of different uh, setups. The one down in the lower left corner is more of a kind of traditional, typical setup. Uh, the diagram in the middle of the page is referencing the lower left-hand corner photo. But they're usually set up with cafe tables uh, because, again, we're trying to create some ambiance. We want to create a situation, a, a space that feels a little bit different than what our typical meeting spaces feel like. There's some Something about being at a cafe table in smaller intimate settings that allow and open up and invite more intimate kind of conversation. Now I realize that not every uh, place you go has small little cafe tables, but at least ask. You might be surprised to find out how many people do it. Even if you don't have cafe tables, try to set up uh, so that it's only four or five people per, per little uh, small group huddle. When you get more than five, the dynamics in the small group change for one. For two, it takes more time for everyone to be able to share in that small group, which means you're going to need more time for your cafe overall. But three, I really feel like it starts to be less effective because the bigger the group is, the more there is uh, the possibility that some people will just sit back and listen more than they will actually contribute. So keeping it intimate with only four or five is ideal. I always shoot for four and then if I have to, I will go to five if the space requires that that's my only option. It's also important that you leave room between the tables because between the different rounds of conversation, people are going to be getting up and they're going to move around so that each round of conversation they're talking with different people. This is one of the ways that we link and exchange ideas in multiple ways across the room, cross-pollinate as we like to say. So make sure there's room for people to easily move about. The tighter that space or the more awkward that is, it's just more time you're going to use up just getting people to move around and it's not very comfortable for people to do that. Another space consideration is make sure you have plenty of wall space. The etiquette that we just looked at or the World Cafe guidelines, uh, as that graphic showed it, uh, that should be posted. Um, you should also be posting the questions that you're going to be exploring during each round and you're probably going to need a space whether it's with easels and flip charts or if it's stuff to put up on the wall, but to be able to harvest either as a large group, either between the rounds or at the end, that you can start to capture some of what's surfacing during the process. We always love natural light. You know, this World Cafe and is really based on living systems and how do we bring the life that's already there into the space. And a light just creates an ambiance that's different that allows us, again, to just feel more alive and be able to contribute. And make sure you have a place for your supplies. You'll need quite uh, some supplies for the various harvesting that you'll do. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But just make sure that you have a good space for all the things that need to happen. And don't be afraid to be creative. Excuse me. Don't be afraid to be creative. Sometimes your spaces are not ideal. Uh, sometimes you don't even have tables. So you may end up creating spaces on the floor that represent where you want people to gather in these small groups. Maybe it's simply the way you're pulling chairs together. There's some of you that are on this call that have seen me do a world cafe in uh, theater style uh, setting where we had tiered seats in rows with tables that span the rows. <laughs> so you get creative with how you do these things. But the idea is we need to be able to create this intimate space as well as an opportunity for the whole group to be able to connect together. Setting the context. Um, this is really important. Again, we're trying to create that ambiance, creating that hospitable space as per our, one of our principles. So really creating a warm welcome, help, you know, helping people slow down and get present. We're always rushing, rushing, rushing from one thing to the next. So how do we help people just kind of land, feel welcome, really invite them into the conversation in a way that's just, you can't not do it. 
be really clear about the purpose and the intention. Notice that I said intention versus outcome. One of the things we want to be careful to do is because we're working with emergence, because we're working with the unknown of what might surface through these conversations, we don't want to be too locked into a particular outcome. So having an intention of what we hope to accomplish or where we hope to get in our conversation is is a good idea, but not to hold on to it too tightly to say we must get at a certain outcome before the end of that conversation. Make sure you provide necessary background to your conversation. Sometimes people are new to the conversation or haven't been involved in all the conversations. Help people understand that context. So whether it's around, you know, how does this link to other conversations that's happened? How does it link to a new opportunity that's come into the community? How does it connect to current strategic efforts that are in place? Whatever that is, help them connect this to what else is happening. I like, I think it's always a good idea to just briefly kind of get a general sense of who's in the room. You don't have to have everybody introduce themselves, but just, you know, invite people to stand up. Who's from healthcare? Who's from early learning and care? Just to get a sense of who's there, that will help people be at ease as they enter into those conversations. Then they can do more specific introductions once they sit at the tables. And again, explain the cafe process and etiquette. You don't have to go through the whole entire process at the beginning. Tell them just enough to have a sense of what's going to happen and then introduce the pieces of the process as you go. But I definitely would make sure to introduce the etiquette at the beginning of the cafe and make sure it's posted. Like in this picture here, you'll see it was posted for the room. It's just to help remind people of what it is, these new practices that we're trying to put into place so that we can do our best thinking and uh, working together. Now the core of the process really is around engaging in multiple rounds of conversation. Typically there are three rounds, though sometimes there could be only two or maybe four, you know, it, it can vary, but generally it's three. And each round is generally 20 to 30 minutes in length. Generally I like to have at least a 20 minute conversation so I may plan for about 30 minutes because then in that 30 minutes it allows enough time to do a check-in with a large group after the small group conversation has happened and that's particularly important if we're moving on to another question and it's important to get a sense of what the conversation in the room was before we move into the next conversation or next question that probably builds on that. Every round is initiated with a question and that question is those questions are critical so we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. And then um, each round, uh, generally the process is, is that you'd introduce the question, giving it good framing, you'd give one to two minutes for uh, each person just to introduce themselves and give it just an initial sort, short response. They're not telling you their whole thesis about the question, they're just giving you an initial response. This creates an opportunity for every person at that table to make sure that they get to share. Then you open the conversation up at the, com at the table, let people talk. Um, um, you know, and exchange their ideas. And while they're doing this, everyone is capturing that conversation on a flip chart piece of paper or butcher paper that's been placed on the table so that not just one person is capturing and recording what's been said, but everybody is because everybody might not hear things exactly the same way or something someone says may spark a different idea that you just want to capture quickly on the paper. And we're encouraged to do that again by drawing, by jotting notes, writing new questions. So so this is a good example of that. And then at the end of each round, we invite one person to stay at that small table as what we call a table host. That person is there simply to help connect the conversation that just happened at that table with the next round of conversation with new people that will be coming to join that person at that particular table. So they're really someone that's there to help um, encourage um, the connecting of ideas from one round of conversation to the next. They're also there to help remind people of uh, the etiquette and to encourage people to continually you know, capture the conversation. They're not there to facilitate the conversation. I'll say more about that in a little bit. All right, the harvest. We've talked a little bit about
collecting some of the responses around that particular question as the large group kind of talked about their small group conversation. You can also use other lenses. You might have somebody else that's listening throughout the whole conversation to be listening for not necessarily the responses to the actual questions that you explored, but listening for other kinds of things like, okay, what were some of the strengths of our community that were named as we explored topic X, Y, or Z, right? Or, wow, where was their real energy and passion? When groups started talking about this or that, boy, did they come alive. Um, what were some of the concerns that were being raised? Maybe we're not actually talking about concerns, but they still will bubble up in the conversation. What kind of resources are needed? Questions that people are asking? So you can actually harvest not only for those specific questions that your cafes build around, but other things that you know may bubble up, and those can be very informative. The harvest can happen both during, in between rounds, and or after the rounds. So again, everyone's harvesting because everybody's encouraged to take notes on those tablecloths, the paper that's on their tables, and those would just build over the course of the, the cafe. But you may also want to have some others who are um, maybe not hosting or facilitating with you, but they're kind of a, a harvester. They're really looking and listening for some of these questions, uh, these different harvest lens. Methods. Again, a variety of ways to do this. You've got the table uh, class you can do. There might be points where you want to get a personal harvest out. So maybe at the end of the round, there's been some really great conversation, but now you'd like everybody to use a post-it note or an uh, index card to simply just write down, okay, what was, what was the most important thing that came out of this conversation for you? And then you could collect those because those will give you another way of kind of synthesizing and seeing what really bubbled out of the conversation. And then, of course, in between rounds, you can have these large group reflection or sharing to just get a sense of everybody knows what the conversation was they just had in their small group, but everybody's usually curious. And part of what we're trying to do is connect all these small group conversations um, so that we get a sense of the whole of the conversation in the room. So you might spend a little bit of time in between rounds just kind of asking people about that and getting a sense of it. And then um, a thing just to, to note is that when we ask people to share, we're not asking people to necessarily report out for their table. We're asking them for, to speak for themselves. So one of the things, for example, I might, you know, one of the things that I noticed at our table as we were talking was, one of the things we had in common was da 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 right? So they're not saying this is what the whole group noticed. They're just saying this is what I noticed. So that's really important. And then the other thing to think about is what's your final harvest? You know, how are you going to capture all these different things that you've been noticing throughout the conversation? Maybe it's a final, it's some kind of a printed document that includes photos and uh, words from the the event. Maybe it's a video. There's lots of different ways you can do that and I really want to encourage you to be creative in doing that. All right, let me just pause there right now uh, just for a moment just to see if there's anything um, that you questions that you're just very curious about. I'm noticing our time so I want to be able to get to some of these tips. Okay, let's talk about some more specific tips then to build on this. I'm going to give you some 15 of my top tips around designing, facilitating, and harvesting. Some of these will be a little bit of a repeat of what we just talked about, but I want to make sure to just kind of drive some of this home because some of the times the things I see uh, that people are doing, they, they forgot some of these really kind of particular pieces that really can make the difference in an effective cafe. So first again, be clear about the purpose of the cafe. People need to understand why they're coming together, why they're being asked to have this conversation. And the clearer they are in purpose, that purpose gives it a container. It gives it a, a reason for coming together and it helps people know how to proceed. Your questions, they gotta be intriguing. But don't just draft the question five minutes before you go to do your cafe. Getting the questions and how they're worded is such a 
craft in and of itself. And it's so easy to um, develop questions that have a lot of meaning for you personally because you've thought about them intensely and they don't really, under, uh, they don't translate well to others. So draft your questions, pilot them with a few people, see how they respond to the question, what kind of responses or conversation it generates, and then edit, revise, adapt them so that they are getting to the essence of what you want the conversation to be about. There is some good um, information in the cafe to go about intriguing questions and if you're interested in taking that even further email me and I will send you a, a great article on uh, writing powerful questions um, remember invite people so don't only create invitation that is inquiry based and gives people a sense of what the conversations about and why they're needed but be intentional about inviting this is about bringing together diverse perspectives so we get a sense of the whole so really think about if this is the conversation we need to be having who needs to be involved um, and be diverse in that. Again, consider when and how often to weave in large group conversation. You don't need to do a large group conversation necessarily after every round, but if you are going to be moving on to a different question, it's a good idea to get a sense of what was this round of conversation? What were these small group conversations? What was emerging? So you can get a sense of what that conversation was overall for the room. Then you can move into your next um, round of conversation that builds on that into the next question. But people will want to know kind of, well, what were other people thinking about this before they're really ready to build and move on to the next? And allow plenty of time for emergence. This is probably one of the number one things I see people doing is they just move through this process way too quickly and it can't, the magic can't happen <laughs> if you're moving too fast. So you have to make sure that you've build in some spaciousness and taking time to really kind of go through um, the process and give people to time to relax and think uh, well together. All right, facilitation tips. Like I just said, honor the process. If you're trying to control the process too much because you're trying to drive it to a certain outcome on your time frame, it may not work. And when you do that, it's really going to shut down the creative potential of the process or emergence as we like to refer to it. Um, you got to trust the process and, and honor the process by following the principles, designing a good process, and then using good facilitation or hosting, but don't over facilitate or host. Engage your table hosts appropriately, like we was just talking about earlier. So often I see people wanting to assign a table host at the beginning and then they say, you just, you know, you're going to be here at this table the whole time. And that person ends up not knowingly over exerting themselves, putting too much kind of, they try to facilitate the conversation too much. Um, if you, that's not the intention at all. It's really, they're there to mostly to just connect the ideas from one round to the next, to encourage that use of etiquette and remind people to capture the conversation. They shouldn't be doing much more than that. As the facilitator or host, I think it's really imperative that you mill about the room as the conversations are happening so you can also listen for what is emerging. So you can get a sense of, oh, what they're talking about over at these tables is similar to what they're talking about over here, but yet there's a whole new idea that's completely different over here. So then as you work with the whole large room, just like you need to be clear about your purpose, be clear on what you're trying to harvest so that you can make a plan for that at the beginning. Obviously, you're probably going to want to harvest around the questions that you use for each round, but if there's other lenses that you're going to be listening for and inviting someone to do, like the strengths or the questions, make sure you know what those what you're asking them to listen for. Make sure you have a plan so they know how to uh, harvest that. And even to have an idea of 
how you're going to report that out later will be helpful at the beginning. You may want to have, just like you'll have someone that's the primary facilitator or host of the conversation, you may want to have someone that's kind of the lead on all this harvesting work, because that's a considerable part. It's, it's great to have a good conversation, but if nothing comes from it, if we're not able to capture the essence of what's uh, emerged, it, it's... It's, it was a good conversation, but not much more. So having a good plan for this. Really encourage you to create whatever product, however you're gonna share back what came out of this cafe, to do it within 24 hours of the conversation, because the longer it goes, the less you remember what the essence of some of these things were. So um, make sure to do that right away. And to capture, you know, in words and images, those tablecloths, that people draw can be very powerful. Sometimes there's things that we can capture in a, a quick scribble or a sketch that is way more powerful than any words can ever be. So in, you know, consider taking photos of some of those and integrating that into your documents or videos or slide decks or whatever you create. All right. I want to share about some resources. Obviously, this hour introduction, especially for those of you that are newer to um, World Cafe, is in no way a training. It's really more of an introduction. And for those of you that are familiar with uh, Cafe, hopefully some reminders of some critical pieces. But I wanted to share with you some resources so you know where to go to get more support and help and deepen your practice. First of all, um, there are some upcoming trainings. If you go to the World Cafe website, which is a photo in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it's at www.theworldcafe.com, and you go to the learning program section, you'll see a variety of listings of upcoming programs. There is one online that's starting uh, just in a couple days. Uh, and then later in October, the same thing will be offered in Spanish. So that's awesome. Uh, there is also an event planned for Chicago in October. We were made for these times. This is with Juanita Brown and David Isaacs and some of the others of our uh, Art of Hosting Community of Practice here in Illinois. Uh, they, uh, Juanita Brown and David Isaacs are the ones that developed the World Cafe process. So they'll be talking a little bit more about the process and you know, how it really is uh, helpful for us being wiser together. The book, The World Cafe, uh, in the middle of your screen is just a must-have if you're serious about doing World Cafe. Tons of great uh, articles and information there. And then uh, the other websites that I would direct you to is uh, To Art of Hosting. You've heard me refer to that several times. It's a particular approach to uh, facilitation that's anything but facilitation, but it's a way of convening um, that really takes into consideration a living systems approach and really how do we create the conditions for emergence using a variety of dialogue-based methods as well as really understanding and working with the complexities of and uncertainties of the big issues that we're tackling uh, in our work. So I encourage you to check those out. And of course, feel free to um, uh, reach out to me if you have any other specific questions. And my email, if you don't have it, is Christina with a C-H, R-I-S-T-I-N-A, at fosterwhatmatters.com. Okay. So for sake of time, since it's almost one, um, I invite you to go ahead again and just email me with any questions or comments that you may have. I do invite you, uh, if you can take just a few more moments, uh, is to use the chat and just say one thing that has been helpful for you from this webinar. It's helpful feedback for us, but we also like to see uh, what is the most helpful. So you can go ahead and do that. And while you're doing that, I want to go ahead and turn this back over to Edna, who will also share with you one more uh, fantastic learning opportunity coming up soon. And again, thank you for your time and uh, good luck with your World Cafes. May the magic in the middle uh, rise up to greet you in your community. Edna? Thanks, Chris. Um, so at this time, uh, we'd like to share one more opportunity um, taking place on Tuesday, September 26th from 11 to, or sorry, from 12 to 1. Um, we will be hosting a webinar on infant and early childhood mental health um, with Allison Lowe uh, photos from um, the Ounce of uh, Prevention Fund. Um, we'd invite you to please